Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joan Brzezinski, and I am the director of the University of Minnesota China Center. Welcome to today's webinar with Professor Ming Na, uh, Ning Ma, sorry, of the University of Minnesota Department of Asian and uh, Middle Eastern Studies. Um, uh, her topic today is cultural kaleidoscopes, martial arts and Chinese literature and films. Thank you for joining us today and for your support of the China Center in this webinar series. I especially thank uh, Kami and Joseph Terry for their generous support of this program. And we invite you to help us manage our mission and give to the China Center through the link at the bottom of this webinar announcement or on our website. Your generosity does make programs like this possible. At the end of the program, we'll take questions from you through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical difficulties or questions, you can certainly chat us and we will respond. Uh, let me start by introducing you to our speaker, Professor Ma. Dr. Ning Ma is an associate professor at the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and director of Chinese flagship program. She earned her PhD in comparative literature and East Asian studies at Princeton University and an undergraduate degree from Peking University. She's an author of The Age of Silver, The Rise of the Novel of East and West, which challenges West-centric theories on novel and of the novel and situates Ming Qing Chinese literature within the context of global early modernity. Today, she'll speak to the themes of martial arts traditions in literature and films. Welcome, Professor Ma. Thank you, Jill, and I really appreciate this invitation. Uh, I have learned so much from this uh, webinar, so it's a true honor to receive this invitation. And also, I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about something that's more than a personal hobby than a research project to me, uh, martial arts, literature, and films. So uh, first, please allow me to indulge in some uh, nostalgia and inviting you back to an era before the iPhones and the iPads and even before personal computers. So what did young people do for fun in China back then? Reading martial arts novels. Um, and in my case, uh, in fact, Jin Yong or Louis Cha's uh, martial arts novel was a huge inspiration um, that introduced me to Chinese history and culture and even inspired me to uh, pursue a career in China studies. Um, so, um, by teaching a class on martial arts literature and films, um, I can get closer to my roots. But at the same time, I also believe in the pedagogical benefits of having a fun class as a gateway to the Chinese culture. Through teaching this class for many years uh, up to now, I've got to experience this tradition I've been familiar with from very diverse and also from intellectual perspectives, thanks to my uh, students. So on this slide, you can see images of some of the texts and the films uh, I cover in my class, including uh, traditional writings, such as Sima Qian's biographies of assassin retainers from the first century BCE, Ming Dynasty novel, Journey to the West, as well as Bruce Lee's 1972 film, Beast of Fury, Jin Wu Men, Zhang Yimou's 2002 film Hero uh, and Stephen Chow's 2004 film Kung Fu Hustle. So probably you notice the absence of Jin Yong's novels on this slide uh, because just sadly I discovered it's very difficult to teach him here uh, because uh, his novels just uh, are too long and also too much digest uh, since so deeply rooted in Chinese culture and history. Nonetheless, I do discover that martial arts films they have a broad impact um, on American public. Many students have uh, spoken to me about their fond memories of watching Jackie Chan's films with their parents when they were young. And some of them got inspired uh, to conduct serious studies of the Chinese language and culture because of their exposure uh, to martial arts films, which really gave them their first glimpse of uh, Chinese culture beyond headline news. So I think all in all, the martial arts tradition is truly a transcultural gateway, creating a more human and even personal image of China for the American public. And as the title of my talk suggests, I see the martial arts tradition as cultural uh, kaleidoscopes. And this metaphor is meant to describe both their internal richness as literary and artistic pieces and the tradition's 
special place in China's past and present and in China's image to the world. Okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to discuss how this tradition persists as an unofficial cultural domain which tells stories about the outcast or the underdog through both tragic and comic forms. And I'm also going to discuss the tradition's connection to traditional philosophies and religions, including Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And in particular, I'm going to argue that martial arts heroes often embody the individualistic tendencies within these traditions. And finally, we're going to discuss how involvements of the martial arts theme during the modern period express intersections between Chinese culture and modernity, especially in terms of indicating national and transnational sentiments. Before we begin, one disclaimer is that I focus solely on martial arts as a literary and cultural motif rather than actual combat styles or physical exercises. Whereas as combat style, martial arts is wu shu, which means martial technique. As a cultural motif, the Chinese term is wu xia, which basically means uh, martial power and the spirit of xia. So let's talk about uh, what wu and xia means respectively. So first, wu means martial or military power. It is the opposite to wen, which could mean writing, literature, culture, civilization. Since an early period, Wen became the dominant uh, value in the Chinese tradition. Uh, and starting from the early Han period of the first century BCE, the imperial state endorsed Confucianism as its ruling philosophy and began to adopt the system of civil examinations or Keju to select officials based on their mastery of Confucian classics. Despite many transformations and some intervals, the civil examination system continued as a dominant cultural institution in traditional China. The centrality of the value of Wen is a distinctive feature of traditional Chinese culture. Within this cultural structure, the value of Wu occupied a subordinate place. And now let's talk about the word Xia. So this word refers to martial heroes or warriors. Some scholars have called Xia the Chinese knight errants. So historically, individuals known as Xia or Xia Ke Yu Xia were active during the chaotic Warring States period. The Warring States period and the preceding spring and autumn period together constitute the Eastern Zhou Dynasty. During the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, the Zhou royal house lost control of its vassals governing different territories, which became independent kingdoms at war with one another. During the Warring States period, seven kingdoms remained. In this chaotic period, individuals with martial skills and sometimes incredible bravery entered the service of noblemen as retainers, or sometimes they formed groups of their own. Generally known as Xia, these individuals often came from the commoner class. Later in 221 BCE, the kingdom of Qin in the West wiped out all these rivals and unified China. The king of Qin became the famous first emperor of Qin, Qin Shi Huang. He unified roles, replaced the feudal system of Zhou with centralized imperial system. However, owing to its tyrannical rule, the Qin dynasty fell very quickly and was replaced by the Han dynasty that lasted for about four centuries. The Han dynasty established the model for all later imperial dynasties in traditional China. During the early Han period, the imperial court began to crack down on influential groups of Xia since they were viewed as a threat. By the time of Emperor Wu during the first century BCE, Xia as a historical group was practically wiped out. However, the idea of Xia persisted in historical memory and literary writings. To understand the cultural values underlying the image of Xia, let's observe 
its connections to Confucianism, Taoism, and Legalism. All of these are philosophical schools that emerged during the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, uh, which was the golden era of classical Chinese philosophy. Confucianism converged with the spirit of Xia in terms of value of Yi or integrity. In fact, the spirit of Xia is often called Xia Yi. So these two words combine together. Yi or integrity implies a willingness to make sacrifices from material comfort to one's own life for a higher ideal. Xia is characterized by a self-sacrificial spirit that conforms to the principle of Yi. Yet on the other hand, Xia's altruism is more radical than what's typically endorsed by Confucianism. Because Confucianism uh, emphasizes kinship ties as the first and the foremost domain to carry out one's moral duties. Whereas a Xia could sacrifice his life for total strangers. But on the other hand, kinship ties and especially filial piety still had a very important place in martial art stories. In fact, many martial art stories feature the theme of filial revenge, in, uh, in particular a son's revenge of the wrongful death of his father. We're going to look at examples later. As to Taoism, its principle Wu Wei, non-action or having no force for actions, seem to contradict the image of Xia. Yet Taoism converges with the spirit of Xia in terms of its promotion of individual freedom and also its anarchist tendencies. Thus, they both pose a challenge to the social hierarchy and the ritual order advocated by the Confucian school of thinking. Also, rather than simply focusing on physical strength, China's martial arts tradition assimilated a great deal of Taoist influences and associate supreme power with the internal cultivation of one's qi or breath, which was considered as a connecting force between the individual body and its environment and even the cosmos. This Taoist trope is extremely prevalent in martial arts uh, stories and films even up to the present. Legalism or fa jia gained currency toward the end of the Warring States period. It became the state philosophy of the Kingdom of Qin, enabling the kingdom's gr uh, growth of military and economic strength so that it could eventually conquer the other kingdoms. Also, imperial politics starting from the Han period were often organized by a combination of legalism and Confucianism. Simply put, legalism is a political philosophy that center on the idea of, quote unquote, two handles, reward and punishment. Legalism also promotes the absolute authority of the king or the monarch. So in its more extreme form, uh, it amounts to totalitarianism. Legalism obviously cannot accommodate the anarchist individualist tendencies in the culture of Xia. And as we have discussed, the social group of Xia was cracked down by the imperial state of the Han Dynasty. Overall, we may say the image of Xia reflects individualistic aspects of Confucianism and Taoism. Both Wu and Xia embody marginalized values in the Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese cultural system. Thus, it's unsurprising that martial arts narratives tend to tell stories about the outcast or heroes from subordinate marginalized groups. Now, let's explore this observation uh, with Sima Qian's historical narratives, biographies of assassin retainers, which can be seen as one of China's earliest martial arts narratives. Sima Qian was a court historian serving Emperor Wu of Han Dynasty during the second and first century BCE. His father, Sima Tan, was also a court historian and initiated a very ambitious project to write a history of the entire known past. Sima Qian inherited this historical project. However, he offended Emperor Wu. 
by speaking on behalf of a general who was condemned as a traitor. He then must choose between two horrible punishments. First, to commit suicide. Second, to suffer castration. Castration was the most humiliating punishment of the period. A courtier was expected to choose death rather than castration. However, in order to complete his book of history, Sima Qian accepted the latter option. He then spent his remaining years to complete his magna opus Shi Ji, historical records. Initially, this massive book was kept in secret, but about a century after Sima Qian's death, it started to surface and became the model for all historical chronicles in the Chinese tradition. Sima Qian also came to be known as a monumental figure in Chinese culture. Sima Qian left behind an influential essay in which he discusses his ordeal and argues that great writing stems from the persecution and the suffering the author endured. In his view, writing serves as a vehicle to pass the ultimate judgment on history because justice is not always carried out in reality. With this perspective, Sima Qin created biographies for extraordinary individuals from the commoner class, even when they failed to carry out their missions or acted against conventional moral codes. Biographies of assassin retainer, for instance, is about a group of individuals who aim to assassinate noblemen and kings. In fact, the last biography of the set is about Jin Ke, whose target was the future first emperor of Qin. Like Jin Ke, some other famous assassins from the biographies, such as Yu Zhang and Nie Zheng, failed to complete their missions. In portraying these fallen heroes, Sima Qin emphasized their determination to fulfill their promises. All these assassins eventually sacrificed their lives, and they were from the lower class. In portraying these figures and basically preserving them in the cultural memory for future generations, Sima Qian broke new grounds in history writing, which previously focused only on the deeds of kings and noblemen. His biography of assassin retainer also exemplified the tragic theme of martial arts narratives and the image of the self-sacrificial hero at the center of this type of narrative. As to more explicitly fictional writings, we need to uh, see, see them from the period of division after the fall of the Han Dynasty, uh, which happened in the third century. So in this era of political chaos that lasted for centuries, Confucian influence declined, giving place to Taoism and Buddhism, which entered China during the Han Dynasty. Correspondingly, there was a rising interest in the supernatural and in fictional narratives. This period of division and the Tang Dynasty afterwards left behind many classical language tales featuring extraordinary and sometimes fantastic subject matters. And here, I'm going to highlight one particular tale, Mei Dian Chu, or eyebrows 12 inches apart, which reflects the confluence of the themes of political corruption, filial revenge, the self-sacrificial hero, and the supernatural in a tragic martial arts story. In this story, in Eastern Zhou's spring and autumn period, the king of Chu commanded Gan Jiang, a legendary sword maker, to forge a pair of swords that are the sharpest in the world. Yet he executed Gan Jiang upon the completion of his swords because he feared that he's going to make the same swords for others. Predicting his fate, Gan Jiang submitted to the king only one of the swords and left the other to his expecting wife. His wife gave birth to a son who had a strange look as his eyebrows were widely apart. Determined to revenge his father's death after he grew up, the son found a nameless man in black robe 
who was willing to carry out justice for him. The son committed suicide, so the man in black could use his head and the other sword left by his father as gifts to approach the king of Chu. In court, the man in black robe beheaded the king using the sword and then cut off his own head. At the conclusion of this story, all three heads, the kings, the sons, and the assassins fell into a boiling pot and became indistinguishable. In this story, the son embodies the passion of filial revenge, whereas the man in black robe represents the radical altruism of the Shia, as well as an idea of supernatural justice against political tyranny. The story's fantastic ending seems to strengthen the ties of these essential themes in martial arts narratives. Now let's move to the 16th century during the Ming Dynasty. Starting from this period, long vernacular novels began to rise as represented by the Romance of Three Kingdoms, San Guo Yan Yi, Outlaws of the Marsh, Xue Hu Duan, and Journey to the West, Xiu Ji. These Ming novels and the Qing Dynasty novel, Dream of the Red Chamber, are now known as China's four classic novels. Notably, the three famous Ming novels all feature martial themes. Romance of the Three Kingdoms is about a fierce competition between warlords during the fall of the Han Dynasty. Outlaws of the Marsh is about a group of bandits rebelling against corrupt officials during the Northern Song Dynasty. Journey to the West is a fantastic retelling of Buddhist master Xuanzang's, pil uh, Xuanzang's pilgrimage to India during the Tang Dynasty for Buddhist scriptures. In this novel, the most memorable character is in fact Xuanzang's disciple Sun Wukong or the Monkey King, who is characterized by incredible magical powers and a mischievous character. Now, based on these basic uh, plot lines, we can see that Three Kingdoms and Outlaws of the Marsh portray political chaos or corruption as in the earlier classical tales. They also enact the tragic theme of the martial arts literary tradition. Journey to the West, however, initiated a comic form of martial arts narratives. At the outset, the Monkey King is a troublemaker who challenges the authority of the heavenly court. Unable to subdue him, the heavenly court solicited the help of Buddha who conjure up a magical mountain to imprison the monkey king underneath for 500 years. Xuanzang, the Buddhist master in the novel, releases the monkey who subsequently becomes his disciple to protect him from the numerous demons during the journey. Upon completion of the pilgrimage, the Monkey King achieved Buddhahood along with his master Xuanzang. The Monkey King is an anti-hero who often acts according to his own impulse. However, he also demonstrates an inherent weakness despite his defiance of conventional ethical codes. The Monkey King is also an outcast. He was born from a magical rock on a remote island in the form of a monkey. And thus, he was slighted by the deities in heaven. His rebellion was to an extent stimulated by the prejudice he, he suffered. The comic style of Journey to the West sustains a moral ambiguity. On the one hand, the monkey king becomes a more disciplined, caring, and selfless character through the pilgrimage. But on the other hand, the novel frequently hints at the unreliability of ritual hierarchy. For instance, authority figures in the novel from the Jade Emperor in heaven to Xuanzang, the Buddhist master, are inept and befuddled. Even the Buddhist paradise is imperfect. For instance, when the pilgrims finally reach the Western paradise, the guardian deities demand bribes from the pilgrims in exchange of Buddhist scriptures. These plot elements create an instability of meaning and place the moral emphasis on the monkey's own behavior and resolves than the ritual hierarchy itself. 
So the Ming vernacular novels we have discussed all have their roots in the oral tradition. Yet their eventual narrative forms as novels depended on creative efforts by members of the scholarly class and reflect intellectual trends of this period. During the Ming Dynasty, many scholars failed in the competitive civil examination system. And due to the rigid structure of the officialdom and instances of political corruption, there was a prevalent critical sentiment among educated scholars against the imperial bureaucracy. In this cultural environment, Xin Xue, or the philosophy of the heart-mind, uh, <coughs> started to rise. So even though the philosophy of the heart-mind belongs to the Confucian school of thought, it assimilated much influence from Taoism and Buddhism. So on this slide, we can see a portrait of one of the founding figures of this philosophical school, uh, Wang Yangming. Simply put, the philosophy of the heart-mind argues that moral truth resides within the individual mind rather than an external order. In this manner, philosophy of the heart-mind can be viewed as a continuation of the more individualistic tendencies within Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. The rise of vernacular novels and its heavy emphasis on the martial arts theme, which represents a marginalized cultural value, correspond to the intellectual orientation of the philosophy of the heart-mind. Cultural trends such as the rise of vernacular novels and the philosophy of the heart-mind indicate a greater emphasis on individual agency within the internal transformations of Chinese culture. The legacy of this intellectual development build up to the rich meanings of the martial arts theme during the modern period. The beginning of modern China is usually traced to the outbreak of the first Opium War between 1839 and 1842. Uh, the Qing government's defeat in this war and the unequal 19th Treaty is subsequently signed with the British government marked the beginning of what's known as the century of humiliation or Bai Nian Guo Chi in Chinese history. Throughout the second half of the 19th century, Qing China repeatedly lost to invading foreign powers, fallen into a semi-colonized status. This crisis triggered rapid modernization efforts within the nation, building to the Republican Revolution of 1911, which terminated China's long history of imperial dynasties. In the context of China's military defeats, military and the physical strength gained renewed meanings in China's modernization process. The reformist Liang Qichao, for instance, wrote a book entitled China's Bushido in order to revive the Xia tradition in Chinese culture. In the historical context of the time, the martial arts tradition became a middle ground between China's past and present. On the one hand, it evolved from ancient roots and could manifest a nostalgic image of Chinese culture. On the other hand, it conformed to the modern valorization of strength while indicating a rejection of the elite scholarly culture that was then felt to be a repressive and reactionary aspect of Chinese culture. Meanwhile, along with the spread of mass printing and mass entertainment, martial arts novels and martial arts films began to flourish in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, in the remaining time, I'd like to focus on the following martial arts films to talk about their contemporary developments. Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury and Jackie Chan's Drunken Master, both from the 1970s, and international blockbusters in the early 2000s, including Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon by Anne Lee, Hero by Zhang Yimou, and Kung Fu Hustle by Zhou Xinxu or Stephen Chow. Thematically, the involvement of the martial arts theme through these films indicate the tradition's national and transnational dimensions. First, 
Let's look at Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury, Teen Woman from 1972. This film reenacts the legend of the martial arts master Huo Yuanjia, who served as a martial arts coach in Shanghai in 1909, but died rather mysteriously one year after. Shortly after his death, Huo Yuanjia became the topic of many martial arts writings. These rather fictional writings generated the popular idea that he was poisoned by Japanese invaders. Also, the historical Huo Yuanjia once answered the challenge of a foreign wrestler who insulted the Chinese people as the sick man of East Asia, Dong Ya Bing Fu. The fight didn't actually take place, but it became a highlight in the Huo Yuanjia story. One of the central plot in Fist, uh, Fist of Fury is actually about uh, the Bruce Lee character's smashing of this uh, sign of national humiliation. Now, the main plot of Fist of Fury is about Huo Yuanjia's fictional disciple Chen Zhen, who was portrayed uh, by Bruce Lee, and his revenge for the death of Huo Yuanjia. Chen Zhen's revenge for his master, who was positioned to a disciple, parallels that of a father to a son, resembles filial revenge. And in the context of the film of uh, the century of humiliation, this filial revenge also becomes a national event, a revenge as indicated by Chen Zhen's destruction of the sign, a sick man of Asia. So Feast of Fury continues the tragic form of martial arts stories, since Chen Zhen's mission, similar to assassins in the past, is very much suicidal. After fulfilling his mission of revenge, he perished at the end of the film at the firing guns of foreign guards. Although Fist of Fury expresses strong nationalist sentiments, it manifests transnational meanings as well. We have mentioned that the tragic form of the martial arts tradition implies a challenge to social hierarchy and celebrates heroes from the marginalized repressed groups. In Fist of Fury, Chen Zhen's fight against foreign invaders reflect China's experience with semi-colonization and can be viewed as an example of post-colonial film. Moreover, Bruce Lee's stardom is transnational in nature. Feast of Fury was produced by a Hong Kong studio but found success in the American market. In an era with American cinema, uh, in an era when American cinema rarely featured people of color, Bruce Lee broke new grounds in becoming one of the first non-white superstars. As such, and also because of his own activism related to racial equity, his image developed a close association with the legacy of the civil rights movement. Bruce Lee's success established the new form of Kung Fu cinema, that is martial arts films in a modern setting and featuring real action fighting. Many hope to repeat his success, but they must figure out their own paths. One of these aspiring actors is Jackie Chan or Cheng Long. After trying to imitate Bruce Lee rather unsuccessfully, Jackie Chan found his big break in Hong Kong cinema with the release of his drunken master, Sui Quan, in 1978, which established the comic style of Kung Fu cinema. In this film, Jackie Chan portrays a young Huang Fei Hong. The historical Huang Fei Hong was a martial arts master and a practitioner of Chinese medicine in the Fushan area of Canton. He became a legend in the Canton and the Hong Kong area after his death in 1925. There are in fact over 100 films and TV series featuring his image produced after 1949, mostly in Hong Kong. Drunken Master nevertheless depicts this famous martial arts figure as an undisciplined young man. His father secretly entrusts a friend, a martial arts master in the disguise of a beggar, a drunken beggar, to train his son. Through a series of comical encounters with his master, the young Huang Fei Hong learns self-discipline and masters the supreme martial technique known as the drunken fist of the eight immortals. And using this technique, 
he defeats a powerful villain who attempts to murder his father. Even though the film's comic style is meant for entertainment, Drunken Master reflects a great deal of Taoist influences. The theme of drunkenness is related to Taoism, since one is supposed to be released from all social inhibitions and from one's own ego in an intoxicated state. In Drunken Master, this sense of inner freedom is manifested through a gender-bending trope. When Huang Fei Hong is finally able to overcome his masculinity and embrace the power and style of the only female deity of the eight immortals, goddess He, He Xian Gu. The film portrays the feminization in a comic light, yet with clear reference to the style of female personification in traditional theater. Chen himself, in fact, grew up in a Peking opera school. His martial arts style is highly acrobatic, reflecting his Peking opera roots. The female impersonation in the film is thus tied to rich roots in the Chinese tradition and expresses a fluidity of identity rooted in Taoist philosophy. This fluidity of identity can also be witnessed from the unconventional physical forms Jackie Chan enacts throughout the film. As he's constantly defeated, we see his body in various uh, contorted, humiliated, uh, or we may say grotesque state. Uh, according to the literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin, the, grote uh, the grotesque body uh, is a liberating literary trope. So although Drunken Master is made for entertainment, its evocation of the influence of Taoism implicitly acts against the modern ideology of strength and against the image of the unitary masculine subject in modern national cultures. <clears throat> in the early 2000s, we witnessed a high tide of martial arts films on the international stage. The first work of this kind is Anli's 2000 film, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Huo Hu Cang Long, which won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. Anli was born in Taiwan in 1954 and came to the United States as a student in 1979. Up to now, Anli has created a truly transnational repertoire of films. While his films had a broad range, re they reveal a consistent preoccupation with psychology and the characters' hidden emotions and desires. Crouching Tiger is his experiment to fuse the Chinese tradition with a modern psychological approach. When carrying out this experiment, Anli also explored the gender dynamics in Chinese culture, which was deeply patriarchal during the traditional period. Nevertheless, there have been traditional legends about lady warriors or nuxia, such as the famous Mulan. Crouching Tiger harks back to this traditional image, but with a more complex story of duty and desire. Two of the film's main characters are Li Mu Bai, the martial arts master, and Yu Xiu Lian, who was once betrothed to Li Mu Bai Bai's sworn brother. That is a brother with him, with uh, him he has taken a serious oath to treat as brother by birth. The sworn brother died early on, but both Li Mu Bai and Yu Xiu Lian were bound by their commitments and had to repress their mutual romantic feelings. In contrast to Li Mu Bai and Yu Xiu Lian, uh, who embody the Confucian ethics of duty. The film's younger female protagonist, you should uh, portray a uh, Jen or Jade uh, Dragon is an impulsive young lady living in an aristocratic household. Secretly, she has been trained by a female master of the nickname Jade Fox. Jen desperately tried to escape from a marriage arranged by his fa her family and thus embark on very dangerous adventures including stealing Li Mu Bai's sword, uh, which represents supreme martial arts power, and falling in love with a bandit lord named Luo Xiaohu. The story of Crouching Tiger ends ambiguously, endorsing neither the sacrifices of the older generation nor the impulsive desire of the young female protagonist. The film constantly uses martial arts movements to reflect the character's psychological states. Through this experiment, Crouching Tiger reveals the rich aesthetic and philosophical potentials of modern martial arts films. 
Zhang Yimou's 2002 film Hero was inspired by the success of Crouching Tiger. Zhang Yimou is the most iconic figure of the so-called fifth generation director in China, and his earlier films such as Raising the Red Lantern and To Live offer a highly critical view of Chinese culture and history, and usually set in the 20th century. Hero is his first ancient costume film and marks a watershed in his career. This film is loosely based on Jin Ke's assassination of the first emperor of Qin. However, rather than continuing with his critical approach and representing the first emperor as a tyrant, Zhang Yimou in Hero presents a very different perspective. The assassins in the end give up on their mission for the sake of national unity. From Hero onward, Zhang Yimou also transformed from an underground director to a mainstream director. And even though Hero didn't win an academy, uh, academy Award, it obtained commercial success on a global level. The Hollywood level investment and box office record of Hero further manifest the beginning of China's blockbuster era, Da Pian Shidai, along with China's rapidly developing economy. By letting the assassins renounce their plan to assassinate the first emperor, the film Hero raises complex questions of, <clears throat> about national unity. To some critics, Hero felt like setting out. Some even charged it as a pian to totalitarianism. Other viewers, however, believe Hero presents a more complex vision on power. Rather than following a linear narrative, Hero adopts a rational-like narrative structure and presents the story from multiple and conflicting perspectives. And this narrative structure destabilizes the final meaning of the film. With its ambiguities, Hero is the haunting film that uses the form of a martial arts film to allegorize Chinese history and human nature, using complex themes and contexts to bridge China's past and present. So finally, let's look at Stephen Chow's Kung Fu Hustle from 2004. Stephen Chow or Zhou Xingxi was known for his nonsensical or molito comedy. Molito is a Cantonese term that means making no sense or absurd. Molito culture originated as subculture in Hong Kong, first in radio shows and TV comedies. Stephen Chow developed this comedy style and spread it far beyond Hong Kong, first to the mainland and then globally. In addition to physical humor, Stephen Chow's Molito comedy is built on incongruity and parody. Incongruity means a mismatch between the beginning and the end or between appearance and action. Parody could be understood as a bad or failed copy, but can be done purposefully to poke fun or comment on the original. On a deeper level, other than a good laugh, these moments remind us of the difference between image and substance and unsettles our habitual assumptions. Stephen Chow's parody knows no borders. Some of his films parody Hollywood films. One example is the homemade 007. In Kung Fu Hustle, we can also see parodies of the Matrix. But Chow also parodies local cultures. For instance, his 1991 film, The New Feast of Fury, contains a hilarious parody of the iconic scene about the sick men of East Asia in Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury. Chow's comedy is for good fun, yet in the larger scale of things, the free mixing of cultural images in his film disrupts what critics have called the core periphery structure in cultural globalization. That is, the Euro-American world occupies a position of global influence, whereas the rest of the world are localized cultures being influenced. Whereas Kung Fu Hustle does assimilate a lot of uh, influences uh, from the Western films, it does not position them as superior or even different from its own local or traditional heritages, as in Cho's many other films. As all these traditions and influences mingle indiscriminately, there's neither center nor prefer periphery. In terms of characterization, the use of parody and incongruity also helps present the image of the unlikely hero, which is the type of protagonist in many of Chow's films. Kung Fu Hustle represents a culmination of Chow's comedy and embodies historical reflections. 
the name of the slum-like neighborhood in the film is Pigsty Alley, uh, Alley, Zhulong Chengzhai. The Cantonese pronunciation of this name is a pun on the Kowloon Ward City. Historically, the Kowloon Ward City was a Ward Qing Dynasty military fort. During the Qing government's negotiation with uh, Britain to lease the new territories, this walled area became an enclave that was theoretically under Chinese uh, governance. Yet the Qing government was unable to or unwilling to regulate the area. The area gradually became a densely populated slum ruled by gangsters. In 1987, through an agreement between British and Chinese governments, residents within the uh, area were relocated and the site became a memorial park. In alluding to this local history, Kofu also evokes the image of an ungoverned nowhere land, which exists on the margins of national cultures and identities. The setting suggests the characteristics of Hong Kong as existing between cultures and outside mainstream political histories, as well as the unlikely heroes at the center of this film. The main plot of this film is about a young man named Singh, who is portrayed by Stephen Chow, impoverished and confused, Singh tried desperately to become part of the local gang, yet he transformed after witnessing the sacrifices made by three martial arts heroes hidden in the slum, a tailor, a cook, and a coolie. Other martial arts masters hiding in the slum are the, landla are the landlord and landlady. As a middle-aged, ungentrified couple, these characters look and act against gender conventions. Using comedy, Kung Fu Hustle pushes further the martial arts tradition of celebrating heroes from the margins. There is also a great deal of traditional philosophical influences in the film. The story is very much about how Singh retrieves his original goodness, which echoes the Confucian theory that human nature is inherently good. In the film, the three martial arts masters sacrifice their lives in their resistance to the gang representing the ideal of integrity in Confucianism. Touched by these examples, Singh made his own sacrifice as well <clears throat> and was once in a near-death state. However, evoking the Taoist trope of the butterfly, which implies transcendence into a different state, the film allows Singh to be reborn with supreme power. Going along with this plot is the interesting role of the martial arts menu, Buddha's Palm. As a young boy, Singh once bought this menu from a beggar, but later realized it's fake. This experience, along with the experience of being bullied, resulted in his decision to become a member of the gang. However, following his rebirth, Singh miraculously mastered the Buddha's palm. This outcome indicates the possibility that the menu could have been true. In terms of the symbolism of the film, it likely indicates that Singh's power resides in his original goodness and can only be awakened once he regains his conscience. This implication is very much in line with the tradition of the philosophy of the heart mind. Overall, Kung Fu Hustle does great justice to his name in representing multiple themes of the martial arts tradition. Beyond laughter itself is laden with philosophical and aesthetic themes and illustrates the rich potentials of the martial arts film. So in conclusion, we have discussed the subversive potentials of the martial arts structure during the traditional period, how it's correlated with individualistic, individualistic tendencies uh, of China's three teachings and its correspondence to the philosophy of the heart mind. During the modern period, we see its allegor uh, allegorical reflections of Chinese history, culture, and national identity, as well as is simultaneous uh, forging of national and transnational identities. We can see the dynamics of the martial arts films and the wealth of creativity underlying the individual works, which enact the martial arts themes in various historical contexts. So um, I really appreciate you being here and this marks the conclusion of my presentation today. Thank you, Professor Ma. That was fantastic. A really interesting dive into the history of martial arts through film and through um, the previous uh, dynasties and literatures. That's just amazing. Thank you so very much.
Um, we're looking for questions uh, in the Q&A function here at the bottom of your screen. And certainly go ahead and post those and we'll get to those. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm wondering a little bit about sort of the mythology that kind of comes along with uh, how crouching, uh, crouching tiger, hidden dragon types of, of martial arts, the fantasy of the um, monkey king. Um, and then yet, then there's that juxtaposition of the reality of the drunken, um, um, the drunken, uh, the drunken, I guess, master. So I, I just, I, where, I mean, is there a, why is that? Where is the trend there? Yeah, uh, so yes, it's definitely a kind of semi-fantastic nature of martial arts, especially when they're represented during the modern period, right? So there's an interesting contrast also between uh, this particular form uh, and the modern ideology of uh, science and uh, rationality. Um, so I think in part is because, again, it's related to the very marginalized uh, position of this cultural form, uh, because even in traditional China, uh, there was a very famous saying by Confucius, uh, so basically, uh, you know, a cultivated gentleman should not talk about supernatural uh, events. Uh, so there was this like kind of a very sort of rational kind of a, a more kind of dominant rational ideology in the past. And the supernatural was subjugated to a kind of, again, a kind of unofficial marginalized place, uh, something that seemed to be improper, right? Uh, but that's precisely why a lot of the scholars became interested in it. Um, it's like they studied Confucianism during the day, but then they read this type of uh, stories or even wrote this type of stories for fun, right? Um, so, um, so there's a good, good deal of fantasy and the supernatural even just in the past uh, in the rise of the martial arts stories. Uh, and this trend sort of uh, uh, continued uh, into the modern period. Uh, and, and also very much related uh, to the Taoist idea of qi, right, which is semi-magical uh, in nature. Um, as a kind of force, you know, that kind of, you know, is related to the physical body, but something that's really outside the realm of modern science. Um, thank you. That, that's very interesting. Uh, so we have a question. Can you recommend any Chinese martial arts novels for English readers? Yeah, there's a very good translation of Ji Yong's Condor uh, Heroes, uh, She Yao Jing Xiong Zhuan. I think that's, uh, the translator's name is Anna Hu Kong Wood, I think, yeah. Uh, so I think the first two books have been published, recently published. Fantastic. Okay, other questions? Is Japanese style judo popular in some places in China? Do you know if internet portal for viewing competitions that you can recommend? in terms of that, uh, that I'm not sure, but in fact, uh, the enemies in Fist of Fury is the Japanese judo school. <laughs> so, you know, in those stories of um, national humiliation, different types of martial arts, they actually represent uh, different, um, you know, national identities and sometimes in a very, very uh, uh, divisive sort of uh, uh, context, right? Uh, you know, those contexts of war and uh, so forth. Um, so uh, again, not too overly familiar with uh, the actual combat styles. <laughs> yeah. well, that's true. Um, somebody's asked, would you please um, redefine the difference between wushu and wuxia? Yeah, wushu is just a technique. For instance, when we talk about judo, right? When we talk about uh, or tai chi, right? Yeah. So these are the particular forms of movements, right? So shu means technique. But then when we talk about uh, martial arts as a cultural theme, as fictions, as films, right, as type of story, I'm presenting this type of heroism, and then it's typically wuxia. Yeah, so xia refers back to this historical group. You know, you might say they were the, uh, they were like mafias, right, <laughs> in the sense that they were gangsters, uh, but they embody a uh, sense of justice, right, especially when justice failing uh, in actual governance. 
Uh, so you may also compare them probably to Robin Hood by right, that type of uh, uh, good bandits. Thank you. Um, the Three Kingdoms and Journey to the West have inspired a lot of Asian pop cultural media. Are there cultural differences between different Asian cultural understandings of Chinese stories? Uh, I, I think that must be the case. Actually, my my class does cover uh, like Kung Fu Panda, right? The American American version of uh, Kung Fu, right? So we look at the kind of spread of this type of uh, influence. So when we, we talk about the core periphery, right? So in general, the West influences the rest. Uh, but martial arts, similar maybe to anime, right, uh, from Japan, uh, represent a kind of counter influence, right? So we can see probably very strongly interesting in the world of video games. Uh, but on the other hand, also uh, in films such as Kung Fu Panda. And personally, I don't really play those games. So <laughs> I have to, you know, rely on the reports of my students. I, I think one interesting uh, theme I noticed, especially with uh, adaptations of Three Kingdoms, which is extremely popular in games, is that um, usually it's really about the competition for power. Yeah, so it kind of lost the, the moral emphasis of the original novel because the uh, Three Kingdoms, the novel itself is extremely Confucian in nature and actually celebrates the losers of the history because they embody right justice and virtue and integrity. Yeah. Um, and was the US Western TV series Kung Fu ever viewed even nostalgically in China? Um, I think He's talking about the series that starred David Carradine, it's very old, um, was in uh, 1980s, I think, or 70s. Oh, and it was I, called I, Kung Fu, and it I, was about a Kung Fu. Oh, I looked into that. I looked into 70s. that. 70s. <laughs> I, I got that right. I was a very young person when it was uh -huh. on TV. Yeah, I, I do know that actually. Bruce Lee, the success of Bruce Lee actually inspired a type of uh, a, a black a kung fu film. Yeah. And did martial arts play any role in repelling foreigners during the Opium Wars? Uh, during, uh yeah. I, actually, I didn't really talk about the boxers, the Yi He Tuan. Uh, not precisely during the Opium War, but later on, right? The the boxer, the um, basically they were. Mostly, most of them were from the peasant class, um, and during the cultural uh, humiliation, during the century of humiliation, right? So uh, this particular class, they developed a kind of xenophobia, um, and uh, there were incidents in which they slaughtered uh, foreign priests as well as their uh, Chinese converts, and this actually built to the invasion of the Eight Nation Alliance uh, by Wu Lianjun at the end of the 19th century. So basically with that invasion, uh, foreign armies entered the heart of uh, Beijing and occupied the Forbidden City as the Qing royal house ran away. So initially the Qing government wanted to use the boxers to fight against the foreigners, but later on they cracked down on the boxers very brutally. Uh, so uh, because they feared foreign retaliation and those boxers, actually they pursue this rather fantastic notion of martial arts and to the point that some of them believe they could fend off bullets uh, with martial arts with the cultivation of their qi. Um, and there's a very interesting film I didn't really have time to talk about today uh, which is Three Hearts uh, Once Upon a Time in China. In the Chinese title is just uh, Huang Fei Hong from 1990s. It's a very interesting film, especially the first one. So I suggest that you look at that film uh, because there's a lot of gong versus kung fu uh, in that film, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to um, wrap it up here. Thank you so much for your time today. And this is a wonderful presentation.